This is a Lamborghini Aventador SVJ, and it's the new top version of Lamborghini's flagship model, the Aventador. This car has a 760 horsepower V12. It'll do zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds. It's limited to just 900 units for the entire planet, and it costs $520,000 before options. And today, I'm reviewing it. This video comes today courtesy of Giovanna Wheels, which makes aftermarket wheels for some of the most exciting and exotic cars in the world. You can check out Giovanna Wheels on Instagram at Giovanna Wheels, or you can check out their website or their Instagram by clicking the link in the description below. I had to borrow this car before Dico Salehi and the owner of Giovanna Wheels could put some wheels on it. You can check out his Instagram here or also by clicking the link in the description below. But anyway, let's talk SVJ. Now, the first event came out way back for the 2012 model year, which makes it basically ancient by supercar standards, but it just keeps getting more insane. The original Aventador had 690 horsepower. Then they came out with the first high-performance version, the Aventador SV, with 740 horsepower. Now, I've already reviewed the Aventador SV, and you can check out the link to that review by clicking the link in the description below. Then they came out with a new base model, the Aventador S, with 730 horsepower, and then they came out with a new performance performance version. And that would be this. The Aventador SVJ is the craziest Aventador yet, and one of the most insane Lamborghini models of all time. Like I said, 760 horsepower, 0-60 to 60 in 2.7 seconds, just 900 for the entire world, and this car will do almost 220 miles an hour, despite a really hefty curb weight of almost 3,800 pounds. And yes, it costs $520,000 before options and options are plentiful. Customize one of these exactly how you want it, and you'll be out the door for $600,000 or more, which is insane money for a car. But then again, this is a special one. So today I'm going to take a look at the SVJ, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the ultimate Lamborghini. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the SVJ, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've compiled a list of some of the best older Lamborghini models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now, I'm going to start the quirks and features back here because this is the craziest part of this car. There are a lot of things to talk about, but I'm going to start with the exhaust. Just take a look at this. The exhausts are right in the middle of the back of this car. They've taken precedence over the license plate. Lamborghini's like, we don't care about regulations or law enforcement. We want the exhaust to be front and center. And they're really, really cool looking. And they look like space shuttle or jet engines that are going to rocket this thing into crazy speeds, which I guess they actually are. But this has to be one of the very coolest exhausts in the entire car industry. And of course, it sounds pretty good too. Take a listen. <laughs> on to the rear wing, which is absolutely ridiculous. Insane, massive, gigantic, continuing the tradition of crazy Lamborghini rear wings that goes back to the Countach, the Diablo, and other models. This particular rear wing is carbon fiber. It has three mounting points on the back. It is that large that it needs three of them. And you can see it says on it ALA. This is Lamborghini's active aerodynamic system, and it's new for this car and for the Huracan Performante. And it works in kind of a complicated way that I'm not going to get into, but I'll give you a basic overview. There are little flaps back here in the back on the engine cover and up front on the front splitter, and they can open electronically and sort of divert air, which allows the car to be really flat and slippery when you're trying to go fast, or it provides some drag when you're trying to go around corners, and it makes the car faster in both arenas. It's a cool feature, and Lamborghini is very proud of it, and so they put the ALA logo here, and they also put it on the front splitter to indicate that it is an ALA part, the active aerodynamic system. And speaking of those electronic flaps on the engine cover, let's talk about the engine cover for a second, because this is one of the craziest engine covers I have ever seen in any car. It just looks insane. It goes along perfectly with the overall look of this car. These vents on both sides that allow heat to come off the engine. You have this piece of glass down the middle that sort of expands itself into this mesh 
air intake looking thing at the base of the wing. It all just looks absolutely crazy. Now, unfortunately, I can't actually show it to you because opening the engine cover in this car isn't as easy as just pulling a little latch on the inside and opening it right up. You need a key, and that's different from the key that you actually use to start the car. You have to put the key inside this little latch, turn it, and then the latch is unlocked. Then you have to do the same thing on the other side, turn it, and then the latch on that side is unlocked, and then you can start accessing the engine cover. But even though I'm not going to open it, two interesting things you can see from this position. One is the fact that you can look in and see the firing order, which is a Lamborghini tradition, the firing order of the cylinders. I think it's so cool that they mount it back there. Obviously, it's in the workshop manual. Anybody working on this car can just look it up, but it's not for the mechanic. It's for people who walk up and look at this car and they walk away thinking, man, that's cool. And it really is. The other interesting thing is these vents that allow heat to dissipate from the engine. In most cars, they have like mesh to make sure leaves or debris don't get inside the engine. Not in this car. It's just wide open. You can stick your hand in there and then just kind of reach around and feel engine parts. And this is true of the Murcielago and the base level of Ventadors as well. It's an interesting design. And next, moving on down the side of the car, we have the air intake. Now, I've seen a lot of air intakes in a lot of cars, but this is probably the biggest, craziest air intake I've ever seen, way larger than the one in the standard Aventador. And obviously, it's an easy way to tell the SVJ apart, as if the giant wing and the decal on the side weren't enough. But just take a look at the massive size of this air intake. This is a huge engine, and well, it needs a lot of air. Other ways you can tell this car apart from the standard Aventador, you have these large carbon fiber side skirts on either side, and you have carbon fiber mirrors, not regular board painted ones like the regular Aventador. But the easiest way up front is this giant front splitter, which is massive, much bigger than the one in the regular Aventador. And like I mentioned, it says ALA on it. And you can even see the little flaps that, like I mentioned, electronically go up and down depending on the type of driving you're doing. Other interesting items on the outside of the car, how about these front turn signals, which are very cool. You have these seven little lights all clustered together. Leave it to Lamborghini to make turn signals cool. And the rear turn signals are even cooler. You have three distinct lights all in this like Y shape pointing to whichever side the car is going to turn. A very cool turn signal style for a very stylish car. Now, next we move on to the front trunk. And I'm going to start with getting in the front trunk, which is a rather weird quirk of this car. In most Lamborghini models, there are three buttons on the key fob, lock, unlock, and the one that opens the front trunk. Now, in this car, there are also three buttons, lock, unlock, and then a third blank button. You can press it, but nothing happens. It doesn't open the trunk. It's not designed to. I don't know if Lamborghini felt they were really getting into the weight saving things by eliminating the function of a button. <laughs> but regardless, you can't actually access the trunk from the key fob even though the button is there and it presses. Very strange. The only way to get to the trunk in this car is this little latch in the driver's floor area. You pull it and the trunk pops to this point and then you can easily open it from here. Now, once you have the trunk open, you will see what I like to call the Bugatti loophole. It's very interesting. Check this out. Here in the United States, the federal government regulation is that if a certain size child dummy can fit in your trunk, then you need to install an emergency inside trunk release so that that size child can pull the trunk release and get out in case they fall in accidentally or in case they've been kidnapped by someone in an Aventador. But Lamborghini and Bugatti have gotten around that by placing this divider inside the trunk. That splits up the trunk trunk area, and it means that the dummy can no longer fit in, even though the dummy would be able to fit in if you pulled out the divider. But with the divider in place, it means that Lamborghini doesn't have to comply with the regulation, meaning they don't have to install that ugly and unnecessary emergency inside trunk release, and so they don't. And so that is why this divider is located here in the trunk. The other thing I like in here is the white gloves. These are for roadside tire changes, so you won't get your hands dirty. <laughs> which kind of makes you wonder why they made the gloves white, kind of defeats the purpose since you will obviously get the gloves dirty, but nonetheless, you have them in case you have to perform a quick roadside tire change on your SVJ. By the way, one other interesting thing I just realized with those white gloves, this car has center lock wheels rather than traditional lug nuts, like most high performance, lightweight exotic cars do. But the point of that is <laughs> you can't remove the center lock wheels unless you have a specialized tool and an enormous amount of force. You basically have to do it in the shop, so you won't be doing any roadside tire changes in this car anyway, but nonetheless, you have white gloves just in case you want to attempt. Anyway, next up, I want to move on to getting into this car. Now, when you take a look at the door, you'll notice there's no incredibly obvious door handle, but if you reach around under this little piece here, there's a little rubber section that you can press, and that pops open the door, and then it goes up like this, a true Lambo door, as you'd expect from your Lambo, adding a sense of occasion anytime you want to get in or get out 
of the car. But speaking of getting in the car, let's say you get in, how do you close the Lambo door? Well, there's no door pull that's been integrated into the carbon fiber door panel. Instead, you have this little leather loop. You reach up, you pull it, and then the door closes. Simple enough. But in this car, getting in is kind of the easy part, because if you look on that door panel, you'll see there's no obvious door handle. So how do you get out? Well, the door handle is mounted on the door sill. It's to the left of the driver's seat, to the right of the passenger seat. And to open the door, you have to stick your hand inside this little plastic piece and then pull up on the silver piece, and that releases the door. And you can see there are two sort of large white items at the top of the door handle. Those are lights to keep the door handle lit at night, so you always know where the door handle is if you're trying to get out and you're driving this car in the dark. Now, next up, one of the first things you notice when you climb in this car, there's no carpeting in this vehicle, no floor mats. Instead, you have this floor covering that's very harsh and stripped down like you'd expect from the lightweight, high-performance version of a vehicle. And you can see it has these little designs on it. These are the same designs that the turn signals have in back, so it's kind of cool to see that design make its way into the interior. The other thing you notice when you step inside this car and sit down is these seats, these ultra-tight carbon fiber sport bucket seats. They really grip you. The intent is they really keep you in your place when you're going around corners at high speed on the racetrack. They're very serious, angry, performance car seats, and yet... On the passenger side, you have the tether for a child seat. So if you want to install a car seat in your SVJ and take your toddler around with you, I guess you can do that. Now, next up, another reality of the SVJ is that there is basically zero storage space inside this car. There's no glove box. There's no center console. So you don't have any storage in the two typical places. There is storage in some other places, though. The passenger side footwell has a tiny little storage pocket where I guess you'd put registration or something like that. And behind the seats, there are a couple nets that have some storage capabilities as well. Now, insanely, despite this complete lack of storage, this car does have a coat hook over on the passenger side in case you want to put your suit in the car and hang it from a hook. And it even has a coat hook on the driver's side, so you could have two suits in here hanging from their hooks, not getting wrinkled. And yet, you don't really have any place you can easily put your wallet or some breath mints or gum, <laughs> but you have space for your suits. Now, next up, another interesting dichotomy. The interior of this car is absolutely insane. The floors, the seats, the center control stack is maybe the most insane piece angled to you coming down from the dashboard. It's the kind of thing you'd expect in an incredibly expensive car like this. And on the center control stack, you have the start stop button, which is under this little red cover. To start this car, you have to flip up the red cover, then press the start stop button, which is just really cool. It may be kind of a little gimmick, but I think it's a really cool and special way to confirm that you're starting to land Lamborghini, not some boring regular car. Now, despite all the craziness in this interior, take a look at the climate vents. <laughs> These just look like standard climate vents that came right out of a Volkswagen Jetta or an Audi A4, some other vehicle in the Volkswagen group. Just standard rectangles with little dials that you can turn up or down to control the airflow. It's the only normal piece in this entirely abnormal interior. Next up, a few other interesting items in this car. To the left of the steering wheel, you have a little button that turns on the automatic headlights that'll turn on automatically when it starts getting dark. A lot of cars have that. But the interesting thing about this car is the auto headlight button. You can see it shows a picture of a Lamborghini with the headlights illuminated, but also the taillights illuminated, reminding us that it isn't just an auto headlight button, but it will also automatically turn on the taillights at night. Thanks, Lambo, for putting that on the button like that. Now, you might be wondering, when you look around this interior, how do you put this car in gear? There's no immediately obvious gear lever in this thing. Well, this is actually a pretty common thing in most supercars. You control basically all of the gears using the paddle shifters coming off the steering column. And when you start the car, it's typically in neutral or in first, but if it's in neutral, you can shift into first by pressing the upshift paddle and it goes into first and it goes on its way and then you can use the paddles obviously to go through the rest of the gears when you want to stop the car pull both paddles at once that puts it in neutral put the parking brake on and then you've parked the car with that said there are buttons in the center console that control some gears specifically reverse you can't access reverse through the paddles because they don't want you to accidentally downshift into reverse that would be very bad so it's a button you have to press in the center console there's also an m button in the center console that puts the car in manual mode, although pulling on the paddles will achieve the same effect. Another interesting item I like in the interior is this little plaque over by the A-pillar that specifically says 1 of 900 SVJ to remind you that this isn't a regular Aventador or even Aventador SV, but rather one of the ultra-rare SVJ models. It's a cool plaque to see while you're driving along. Now, next up, moving on to the gauge cluster. It's completely a screen, and even though this car is six, seven years old, 
This is basically the coolest gauge cluster in the entire car industry. Just look at this thing. Look at the rev counter. It is just so exciting and so thrilling, and it contributes to the feeling that you absolutely are not in a normal car when you look at that gauge cluster screen. Now, in the regular Aventador models, the gauge cluster screen can change quite a bit depending on what drive mode you're in. But in this car, because it's the aggressive, high-performance SVJ version, it's always in this kind of angry track-looking setup. But you can at least change the color of the display. If you're in strata mode, that means street, the display will be white. If you move over to sport, then the display, the gear you're in, turns orange. And if you move over to Corsa, which is like racetrack or race mode, then it turns red to remind you that now you're in the high performance mode in your high performance Lamborghini. Another cool thing about the gauge cluster is the fact that it actually shows in real time what's happening with the ALA system. You can see this little graphic here, and when you're driving along, it shows where the air is flowing and where it's going out and where it's coming in. And that stuff is pretty technical for me. I don't usually dive deep into all those little technical details, but for people who are into that stuff and who are into seeing exactly how that stuff is working, it's cool to see it in real time on the gauge cluster. One other interesting item with the gauge cluster is over on the right, if you have the door open, it will let you know that you have the door open, like almost all cars and it does so with this very precise, accurate depiction of an SVJ from the top down. Very nice to see that there. But the interesting part is, if you do have the door open, it's warning you by showing you an image of the car with the door open like a normal car door and not like a Lamborghini door. It's very odd they'd go to the trouble of making the door like that and making that graphic and then have the graphic show the door opening incorrectly. Now, next we move on to the infotainment system, which aside from the old school sequential manual automatic transmission instead of a dual clutch, the infotainment system is probably the easiest way that you can tell this car is starting to get old and showing its age. And I say that because the infotainment system is not a touch screen. You don't touch it like basically every other car, even standard regular old passenger cars, Toyotas and Hondas. Instead, you select various items on the infotainment screen by pressing the corresponding button down in the center control stack. So if you want to select what's in the upper right, you press the upper right button, lower right, lower right button, etc., etc. Audi had its infotainment systems like this for a long time. Obviously, Volkswagen and Audi is the parent company of Lamborghini, so that's why this car has it, and I suspect this is the last Volkswagen and Audi model that is still using this old-school infotainment system. Now, one interesting thing about this infotainment system is the scroll function is backwards. It's tremendously counterintuitive. You can see here I'm turning it to the right, and it's not doing anything. That's because to scroll down, you have to turn it to the left which just doesn't seem right to me. For some reason, mentally, I feel like to the right should scroll down, but indeed you turn it to the left and it scrolls down through the various menus. Now, next up, this car has a section in the infotainment system entitled Lamborghini Telemetry. You click on that and then you have to scroll backwards, of course, through a very long waiver that tells you don't use this while you're driving, don't ever use this under any circumstances, never even look at this, and then you accept that and then you're in the Lamborghini Telemetry system. And the Lamborghini Telemetry system is cool. It's a lap timer and it can tell how fast you're going around racetracks. You can even have it display a ghost lap time, like your best lap time ever while you're driving, so you can tell if you're behind the pace on a certain racetrack, and it'll even allow you to configure various drivers, so if driver one is really fast and driver two is really slow, they can have their own times saved in the system. It's a cool feature, and obviously a lot of these high-performance cars have something similar, and so does Lamborghini. The most interesting thing to me about the Lamborghini telemetry system, the scrolling is now the correct direction. You go in there and you turn it to the right and that scrolls it down just like you would want in all the other menus, but only Lamborghini Telemetry has the scrolling going that way. Two other interesting items in the infotainment system. One is the fact that this car has parking sensors. You can adjust the volume of the parking sensors, but you can also adjust the frequency, which means you can use the frequency adjuster to play a nice little tune. Check out my song. Now, the other interesting thing in the infotainment system is the fact that this car comes with a speed limiter, which is a good idea because you're driving a car this fast, you can easily look down and realize you're going 100 miles an hour without even knowing it. So this car has a speed limiter that'll beep and let you know if you're over a certain speed so you can avoid a ticket. Now, the interesting thing, though, is the speed limiter in this car, you can turn it on starting at 20, 25, 30 miles an hour, which I find to be kind of funny. You can have it beep to let you know that you're going over 25 in your 760 horsepower Lambo. <laughs> and so those are the quirks and features of the Aventador SVJ. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. Driving the SVJ. 
I'm very excited to drive this car because it's one of the most ridiculous cars that has ever existed. All right, first impression driving this car. The, uh, the transmission still feels old school. You know, one of the complaints about the Aventador is it's like the last supercar that hasn't upgraded to a dual clutch. Um, Lambo says it's almost as fast, but it doesn't really feel it. It feels a little slow. <laughs> but it's really quick. It sounds amazing. And the steering and handling is incredible. One of the most interesting things I find about this car is the fact that it's able to feel as nimble as it is, considering that we all know how big it is. It just does a great job of feeling like a nimble little sports car, even though we all know it's actually a nimble big sports car. Of course, acceleration is just maddeningly insane, and the sound is crazy. The ride is tremendously harsh. You can just feel we're on smooth road right here, and yet I can still feel I'm kind of getting kicked around. But you'd have to be an idiot if you buy it thinking that that's something that is a reasonable possibility. You know, you buy a regular Ventador, you buy an Ventador SV, this is going past all that and getting the craziest track one. It's gonna be a little rough. I really like, or find interesting at least, the way that everything is set up inside this car. It's just insane. Uh, there's no point when you're driving this vehicle that you feel like you're in a normal car. You do feel like that in some cars. Audi R8, you could be lulled into thinking you're just in an Audi. But in this car, this, the steering wheel, the entire interior setup, everything you can see, the engine in the back, everything just makes it seem as ridiculous as it is, which is very ridiculous. The acceleration is just maddeningly quick. The car is incredibly, incredibly fast. Even at half throttle, it just feels like one of the fastest cars ever. And you're just acutely aware of how much more there is. It changes direction so fast considering it's half. It just, it, it's incredible to me every time I drive an Aventador, just how fast it can change directions. It is incredibly precise. Man, when you go, it just goes. It is so incredibly fast. Lambo, I mean, the car is old, the Aventador is old, we all know that, but like, <laughs> does it, if it's really that fast and that exciting, does it really matter how old it is? I mean, it just feels incredible, and each new version is just even more insane, and this is the most insane one yet. And so that's the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. It's clear from the moment you look at this thing that it's one of the most insane Lamborghinis ever, one of the most insane cars ever, and that becomes even clearer when you drive it. It's also probably the swan song for the Aventador, as this is likely the last version of this car before it's redesigned and replaced with something else, and that makes it even more special. And now it's time to give this car a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Aventador is aggressive and crazy looking, but maybe not beautiful, it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration, it's an easy 10 out of 10. Handling is tremendously impressive, but you do feel the weight of the car more than, for example, the Ferrari Pista or the Huracan Performante, it gets a 9 out of 10. Fun fact is as high as it goes is a total blast in every sense of the word and it gets a 10 out of 10. Cool factor is very high, the Aventador is cool already and this is the latest and greatest one and it gets a 9 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 46 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Aventador's infotainment is getting old but it still has basically everything you'd expect in this segment and it has some new tech too like the ALA system and that wonderful gauge cluster and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is not too bad but not great and it gets a 3 out of 10. Practicality is low, the trunk is large enough, but otherwise this car isn't very practical, it's hard to drive it anywhere, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, value. These are monstrously expensive, and it's an old chassis with an old transmission and old tech, but they're going to keep their value well due to the relatively low production numbers, so it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 70 out of 100, which is very strong, but only just ties the Huracan Performante. The Aventador SVJ beats or ties all of these cars in the weekend category, except the crazy new Ford GT, but the Aventador just isn't very livable every day, which is kind of the point.